Um, uh, as I was thinking about this talk, and I think everyone in this room is either a founder or entrepreneur of some sort, I thought I'd do it in the traditional arc of a startup. So we're going to start by challenging uh, the assumptions and biases we had. We're going to have a period of excitement and opportunity uh, with some optimism, picking up where uh, Stefan left off. Uh, a cold dose of reality. After that, we'll go through that period and then just leave everybody, hopefully, uh, with a bit of a tactical plan on what you may all do next. So give directly. Uh, give directly gives cash transfers and capital grants to the extreme poor uh, in Africa. No strings attached. Now, many of you are probably thinking that's a terrible idea. And there are a lot of reasons why you may think that. We have the old expression, give a man a fish, feed him for a day. Uh, and then we uh, ha may have an image of someone on the streets with a brown bag, uh, or in this case, the uh, literally listed as the hobo from Big Daddy. But we all have this sense that giving money to the poor is probably not a great thing, and they may waste it. Either they're lazy, stupid, or something else. But there's a bit of a tension here between how we want to be paid and how we might give gifts uh, and the way we think about giving to the extreme poor. So I actually moved a few weeks ago and was trying to figure out how do you pay movers in New York and how much are you supposed to tip them? Because unlike here, you have to tip everybody in the US. Um, so I found this amazing post which says, can I tip movers with food or drinks instead of cash? And it gives incredibly practical advice. It says, substituting food and drinks is not recommended, while pizza and beer are widely recognized currencies by friends and family. The pros generally prefer cash. <laughs> and then it gives you a specific explanation which you could replace uh, with the poor. So your movers might be busy after completing a job or simply uninterested in eating or drinking. Uh, put the poor in. The, the poor may not need food. They may need health care. They may need something other than what you're providing. After all, you wouldn't want a sandwich instead of money on your payday. Offering food is a kind gesture but they shouldn't be substitutes for money. So I think we have a tension between that initial image a lot of us have, and I include myself in that when we started Give Directly, uh, and the advice uh, we would give. So why, why is this even an important question? Uh, and what's the opportunity? So th this is a graph of two things. It is a graph that I could spend a half a day giving you the caveats on why it is imperfect, but it is meant to be a little bit thought-provoking. Um, so if you look at the dark blue line, this is the cost of closing the poverty gap. This is how much money just arithmetically it would take to get everybody over the poverty line. Um, and again, to Stefan's point, uh, it has been coming down meaningfully over time. So we're getting closer and closer to the goal of ending extreme poverty. And at the same time, if you look at foreign aid, uh, it's been going up. There are some blips up and down. Um, and in about 2005, those two lines cross, which means that we are spending more money on aid than arithmetically would cost to eliminate poverty. Now, there are lots of things that are not going to be replaced by cash, public goods, uh, health systems, roads, and so on and so forth. And we cannot magically put money into the hands of the poor. But if nothing else, this is the opportunity. And this should provoke a bit of thought about the question. So let's spend another second on what that opportunity actually is. So what's the evidence on cash? We spent a lot of time on evidence today, um, Rachel. Um, has talked a lot about randomized controlled trials and the importance uh, of doing proper scientific research on what works and what doesn't. Uh, this is old hat for I think, most of us in tech uh, and is relatively recent to development, kind of the early 2000s. Um, IPA, JPAL, and others have really led the way. So this graph is a graph. I'm not going to go through every paper, but needless to say, cash has probably been one of the most thoroughly researched development interventions. Um, with positive impacts that do depend on context and range in size, um, but there really is a lot of work across the globe. The second part of the opportunity, which is one that I think is just incredible, is the fact that we can now pay people that we never could have reached before. So before you had to wait till the bank and the bricks and mortar showed up on the corner and there was a branch or an ATM, the way a lot of us would get money. Uh, that's just not the way payment rails have evolved, uh, especially in Africa, where mobile money, the ability to get paid on your phone, has been the predominant way of reaching the extreme poor. And there are a lot of people that can be reached this way. <coughs> mobile money is now in 93 countries. 
Uh, the population of those countries is about 4 billion, and about 400 million of those people are already active users of mobile money. Now, I think that's pretty powerful that we can sit here and send a payment, go online, send a payment. Uh, we do this as give directly to someone in a refugee camp in Uganda or Kenya or somewhere else. That really changes the game in what's possible. So we have the evidence uh, and we have the technology. This will be the last positive slide for a bit, so <laughs> take it in. Uh, the rhetoric has changed. So when we started Give Directly, we launched publicly in 2011. If you look back, the, all the headlines were, is it crazy to give cash to the poor? Um, what are these economists doing? Is it nuts to give money to the poor? And that's dramatically changed. Uh, you saw here in the UK, the Prime Minister came out publicly in support of cash transfers and the evidence behind it. And probably one of the more powerful statements comes from the former Secretary General, who not only advocates for cash, but says that cash-based programming should be the preferred and default method of support. And the change of framing there is important because it says, let's start with cash and let's justify when we do something that's not cash. What can we do that's better than cash? And there will be things that we can do better than cash, but at least let's force ourselves to have that hurdle. Okay, so what's happened with that rhetoric? Uh, the answer is unfortunately little. Uh, about less than 1% of US funding right now goes as cash transfers, uh, and less than 2% uh, of UK funding is cash-based. The other 98 and 99% is not the evidence-based things that we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about, whether it's graduation or bed nets or deworming. Um, that's not what's making up the bulk of that 98%. Uh, you'll still see things, the training programs, the microfinance, food aid, where we're sending ships from the U.S. that are half empty because of pre-existing shipping contracts that were negotiated. Uh, that's the stuff that's making a lot of that. And that's also the really big part of the pie. So philanthropy has a critical role, but it is not the biggest piece of funding. It is aid and it is government spending. So how do we change that 98 and 90%, 99%? So this is what the sector looks like today. Uh, it's confusing. The slide is meant to be confusing. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of it in detail. Uh, there's a great piece by Owen Barter over here at CGD saying, well, why hasn't the sector changed? And he calls it the collusive intransigence of the sector. So you start with a donor. We've got a recipient. We've got all this stuff in between. So just to walk through quickly. So a big donor gives money to a UN agency. Let's use the World Food Program. Now, the World Food Program has a specific mandate to do food security. So right away we've said, ah, health, all that other stuff doesn't matter. What the poor ask for doesn't matter. We have to focus on food security. So we've just spent money on that, and we've lowered the decision-making power in the chain. Now they're going to write a very big check to a global NGO who will likely transfer that to their country office, who will likely then find a local partner to actually implement the program. As you go from left to right, there's less and less decision-making, and there's also less and less money in the system. And I think that's the power of cash. Because when you have the technology and the evidence behind cash, you don't necessarily need those various layers of intermediates. You can do something like this. Uh, in the case of Give Directly, we control the operations, the supply chain from top to bottom. Uh, that lets us do things like customer feedback surveys that then feed into employee compensation in the field. Um, I don't know many other nonprofits that do that or can do that. So what's happened? So we have this collusive intransigence. We haven't really started shifting the sector yet. <coughs> well, the poor are not dumb. They're not lazy. Um, they know what they need, and they go out there and get it in many cases. Uh, this stat has always really captured me, which is that 70% of Syrian refugees have actually gone ahead and sold their food aid. So we spend a lot of money shipping food, and then they just go ahead and sell it on the local market, which, as you'd imagine, hurts local producers as well. So what do we do about it? The first thing is to realize that you guys and the public are the customers. The donor is the customer. And if you want a smart product in the sector, you have to be a smart customer. And I use the example of the, uh, the, uh, the phone. So you pay for a phone, you get a phone. You don't like the phone, you don't buy from whoever you buy phones from the following year. Um, 
And what we've seen is we've seen innovation over time. We've seen a pretty big change uh, in what the phone looks like. Uh, now, in the AIDS sector, the person that benefits is the poor recipient, but the person that donates is you. And there's a gap. And often you are ref relying on the NGO or organization to tell you how good of a job they are doing. And I want to push everyone here to ask the tough questions, because the more you can do play proxy for the poor and ask whether this is having impact, the more the sector will respond. Uh, one fact that I, I found yesterday, which just blew my mind. So if you look at the largest five for-profit companies in the world, the oldest one is 1975, Microsoft. So we pretty big change over the last 50 years in the largest companies in the world. If you look at the largest nonprofits in the world, the youngest company is from 1910. So how do we change? I would encourage people to ask three questions. The first is, What's the end-to-end -end cost of an intervention? So if we start at the beginning of the funnel with $100, how much value shows up in the hands of the poor? And it's a really hard question to answer. Um, Joe, who leaves partnerships um, for Give Directly uh, in Europe and was over at DFID, sat with me uh, in many meetings. And this question simply cannot be answered for most organizations. And the IRS and the accounting practices don't do much to help. To give you the simplest example, if I took out $100, which I don't have at the moment, kept one and gave 99, and each person took one and gave 99, on our 990s, the charity reporting form, we could all report 99% efficiency. We all look great. And if the last person, you probably get a dollar. The system was 1% efficient, but each organization in it looked quite efficient. So really get to the bottom and ask those tough questions and do your homework to understand where the money is going. The second is the impact side. So has there been an external randomized evaluation of the project? What does it say? And I say external specifically because, as we saw with microfinance, many things, I can say whatever I want on the website. Yeah, we ran an RCT and everyone became a millionaire. You can put whatever you want on the website. Um, so really make sure that this has happened and make sure it was pre-committed to. Because it's also just as easy to have an RCT done by an external party and then prevent them from publishing it if you haven't pre-committed to releasing those results. And the last one, which is the most meta question, is whether or not the organization is doing more good than the poor could themselves. I can tell you now there are going to be lots of things that should do better than cash, but we need to start holding them accountable for making that justification. And the analogy I like here, and I don't know how many of you know Vanguard or the index fund in the investment industry, but they've essentially set up what's called a passive investment vehicle. So it's quite cheap. You just basically buy the entire market. And it is not 100% of investing today. It's about 25%. But it has been a benchmark for every hedge fund and private equity fund. So they need to make the case that after their fees and after their expenses, they're beating this really cheap alternative. Alternative. So if you look at Berkshire Hathaway's second page of their annual report, they list the index fund, they list their returns, and they make the case that they're doing better. How far are we from a world where we simply make the case in the sector that we are doing more good than just giving money to the poor? So why hasn't it happened yet? I found this uh, in the spirit of, uh, yeah, uh, be being here, this uh, great quote from The Spectator, which basically says, why do we not discover it before? And one scary possibility presents itself, quite simply, because many people like performing jobs that are visibly charitable and altruistic. Might they overcomplicate solutions through the unconscious urge to play a heroic role in achieving them? <laughs>